Every year, hundreds of people go missing under baffling conditions inside the woods of North America. I'm talking about people being right in front of someone and then in a second they're gone and they're never found again. Or somebody goes missing and then they're found again, but in a location that's impossible to get to. One former police detective named David Politis has investigated thousands of these strange disappearances and he documents what he finds in his incredible book series called Missing 411. Today, we're gonna to look at three of his cases that even amongst strange disappearances, these stand out as particularly bizarre. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to make the like button a hot pocket, but don't let it stand in the microwave for two minutes. Instead, serve it to them immediately so that when they bite into it, they are met with the tongue scalding cheese lava flow within. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. hours of January 12th, 2016, 18-year-old Dylan Parker was attending a party in his hometown of Osborne, Idaho. Towards the end of the night, Dylan decided he wanted to leave the party, but it was snowing and cold outside, so he called his mom and he asked her if she would come pick him up at the gas station just down the road from the house he was at. His mother would say it was obvious Dylan had been drinking because he was slurring his words, but at the time, even though she was upset about it because he was underage, she thought, you know what, it's cold, it's snowing, I just wanna get my kid home safe and we'll deal with this tomorrow. So she agreed to pick him up. She hopped in the car and began driving to this gas station, and as she's driving, she gets another call from her son. This time, he sounds totally panicked and scared, and he's asking his mom, you know, where are you, where are you, mom? And she's telling him, I'm gonna be there in a minute, I'm just down the road, calm down, I'll be there in a minute. And then he hung up. When she got to the gas station, he wasn't there. When she tried calling him back, his phone was off. She got out of the car and went into the gas station and asked if they'd seen her son. And they said they hadn't. She got back in the car and she drove around for about 30 minutes yelling for her son, but there was no sign of him. She still couldn't get in touch with him. His phone was still off. And she just had this bad feeling that something had happened to him. So she called the police. The police conducted a thorough search that started with the house Dylan had been at for this party. They interviewed the people who were there and everybody said Dylan seemed fine and he just left. He said he was getting picked up by his mom. But as they looked around town, they just could not find any sign of him. 10 days later, Dylan's body was found in an area nobody was searching. In fact, he was found by accident by two people that crashed their ATVs in the middle of the night and then went back in the daytime the next day to retrieve their ATVs. And that's when they found Dylan's body. He was located outside of town, high up a hill in a dense forest, which in order to get there, he would have had to walk the opposite direction of the gas station. Now, toxicology reports showed Dylan had been under the influence of alcohol, but this was his hometown. He certainly knew where the gas station was, and he would have known he was walking in the complete wrong direction, especially when you consider walking towards the gas station was like walking towards the center of town. There was lots of lights, lots of indication you're going in the right direction. To walk in the other direction towards that hill where he was found would have been like walking towards darkness where there's no lights, there's no sign of town. It's obviously the wrong direction. But the case gets even stranger because on the day Dylan went missing, there was a lot of snow on the ground, which meant people would have made tracks. And from the time Dylan went missing until he was found, it didn't snow and the temperature did not heat up enough to melt the snow. So in theory, any tracks Dylan would have made, they would still be there when he was found. But where Dylan was found, there were no tracks anywhere near him. No footprints, no tire tracks, nothing. It was as if someone had dropped him out of the sky. Another strange element of this case is Dylan was found without pants and without boots on. And so you would think for him to make it all the way up to this spot on the hillside through kind of rough, rocky, snowy terrain through a forest that you would expect his socks to be totally ruined and his feet to potentially be cut up but his socks were clean and his feet were uninjured. This led investigators to believe Dylan must have somehow made his way to that spot on the hillside in that forest without leaving any tracks. And then once he was there, he removed his pants and his boots. Except dozens of police officers and sniffer dogs were never able to find those pants and boots, despite the fact they should, in theory, be in that immediate area where he took them off. While he determined Dylan's cause of death to be hypothermia, the deputy coroner, David Roos, was convinced there was something off about this case. After local authorities came out and said Dylan's death was an accident, David became very vocal in the media saying he disagreed 
speed, and he thought Dylan had been attacked. But the county never reinvestigated Dylan's case, and in fact, they went on to fire David Roos, the coroner, saying he was no longer qualified to do the job. David says they fired him to keep him quiet. As a result, we may never know the truth about what happened to Dylan. Dustin Self was born and raised in Piedmont, Oklahoma, which is a small community just northwest of Oklahoma City. Growing up, Dustin had always been kind of a mediocre performer with so-so grades, didn't take things too seriously, but in his senior year, he discovered weightlifting, and it seemed to give his life a much-needed sense of purpose, and it really kind of helped him organize all aspects of his life. So by the time he was graduating, he was not only in great physical shape, he had also managed to raise all of his grades up significantly, and he seemed to be on a path to success. But interestingly, after high school, he didn't pursue higher education, he didn't go get a job, he didn't try to spend more time with friends and family. Instead, he decided he wanted to go live in the wild. His family believed this was due to his obsession with the Hollywood film Into the Wild, which is about the true story of Christopher McCandless, who gives up a promising career to go live off in the wilds of Alaska. Christopher would ultimately die in the wilds of Alaska after eating a poisonous plant, or some say he died from starvation. So about a year after Dustin's high school graduation, he was 19 years old, it was March of 2013, and he finally felt like he was ready to go live out this dream of living in the wild. And so he told his family he was gonna go on this cross-country road trip, stopping at different points along the way, living out in the woods. His family knew he was really fixated on this and couldn't talk him out of it, and so they ultimately accepted it and said, just be really careful. So in early March, Dustin heads out on this road trip and nobody hears from him until March 15th when he calls his parents and says, I'm in this tiny town called Fields, Oregon, and I'm at a gas station. Everything's going great, nothing to worry about. The very next day, Dustin called his ex-girlfriend and told her he was lost on a mountain. And his ex-girlfriend said she couldn't really understand what he was saying, and she was actually at the airport about to board a plane, so it was noisy, and she stepped into a bathroom to hear him more clearly, but even as she's hearing him, what he was saying just wasn't making any sense. He was talking about this mountain he was lost on, and he was referencing that there were people that were after him, and it was just very confusing. And before she could get any more clarifying information from Dustin, he hung up, and then she couldn't get back in touch with him. So she calls Dustin's father and she tells him that she had this really weird conversation with Dustin where he said he's lost on this mountain. And even though I didn't really understand what he was telling me, he sounded really, really scared. Dustin's father thanked her and then spent the rest of the day trying to get in touch with his son. But every time he called, it just went straight to voicemail. The next day, when he still hadn't heard from his son, he called the police. The police did not have a great idea of where to start looking for him because Dustin did not specify to his ex-girlfriend what mountain he was actually lost on. All they had was his last known location, which was that gas station in Fields, Oregon. So they went to that gas station and he wasn't there. And they asked the people that worked there if they remembered Dustin and they didn't and no one knew anything about him. And so after that, they just had to wait for more leads to come in because they couldn't just, you know, search all the mountains in Oregon for Dustin. They would never find him. A month later, after no one's heard from Dustin, a ranch hand who was living in a very rural section of Oregon, not far from the gas station in Fields, Oregon, discovered Dustin's truck parked precariously on the edge of this road inside of a canyon. It was abandoned, but inside were Dustin's GPS, some food, and some energy drinks. His backpack that contained his sleeping bag and his tent were missing. There was a comprehensive search done around where the truck had been found, but after a couple of days, nothing had been found and the search was terminated. The area around where Dustin's truck was found was very hilly and rocky, but there weren't that many trees, which meant if you were standing on one of the different mountains in the area, you'd be able to very easily look out and actually see a road. And so the searchers were thinking to themselves, how could this guy have gotten lost on any of these mountains? Because all he'd have to do is look over there and there's a road and therefore there's help. Six months later, a hunter was up in those mountains near where Dustin's truck was found and he was actually moving through one of these small sections of aspen trees. And as he was walking through, he thought he saw a deer and he was kind of stalking through these trees. And he gets to an opening where he looks down and he stops because underneath the bush is an obviously dead man, not wearing any clothes, who's on his hands and knees. And it looks like his head is stuck in the ground. When the hunter walks over to get a better look, it looks like this guy must have pushed his head into a hole in the ground before he succumbed to whatever killed him. The hunter leaves and tells police. Police show up, they search the 
area and they find a jacket nearby inside of which is a wallet that contains Dustin's ID cards as well as Dustin's car keys. The body was Dustin's. Dustin was located nine miles away from where his truck had been parked on that road and nowhere in the area did they find a campsite. They actually never found his backpack that contained the tent or the sleeping bag so they think he never set up camp but they don't know where his supplies went. After Dustin's family found out what happened to him his father would say I just don't understand why he didn't seek shelter in his vehicle. It was parked on the road. He wasn't that far away. Heck, he could have run those nine miles. He was in great physical shape. And in theory, he would have known where he parked it. Or if he didn't, he could have just walked to the edge of the mountain and looked out and seen the road it was parked on. So the family just couldn't understand his decision making. Investigators would say there was no indication Dustin was trying to hurt himself and foul play was ruled out. So what was it that caused Dustin to abandon his car and walk nine miles uphill and ditch his clothes and ditch his backpack that contained his tent and his sleeping bag and then stick his head in a hole until he died? The only thing that could be determined was that Dustin probably died of hypothermia, but because of the state his body was in from decomposition, the coroner said we don't know for sure. So like all the other missing 411 cases, we're left with lots of questions and not a lot of answers. In 2010, Jan McAbee was living with her husband Bruce in a town called Lima, Ohio, which is approximately 80 miles southwest of Lake Erie. While Jan had built a successful career as a booking agent for musicians, bands, and entertainers, her real passion was deer hunting. So on September 29th of that year, right after deer hunting season had opened in Ohio, Jan decided to go out on a hunt. That morning had been cold and damp and gray, but by that afternoon, when Jan was getting ready to go, the temperatures had risen and the sun had come out. Jan's preferred method of hunting was to sit and watch from a tree stand, which is a ladder that you put in the woods that sits about 15 feet high. She would sit up there with her bow and arrow and wait to take a shot when a deer came by. Around 5 p.m. that day, she told Bruce she was leaving and she made it to her tree stand by about 5.30. The forest she was going to be hunting in was one she was very familiar with and it was not very remote. There were a couple houses just outside the woods, there were some agricultural areas, and her nephew actually went to high school just a mile north of these woods. But from the tree stand where she was sitting, all she could see around her was trees. Shortly after Jan sat down, she started texting with one of her friends on her Blackberry and periodically she'd poke her head up and look for deer, there weren't any, and then she'd go back to texting. The whole time this is happening, Jan can hear birds and crickets and squirrels and all the sounds of the forest all around her. A little after 6 p.m., her texting conversation with her friend reached a natural conclusion, and so she went back to just kind of sitting in the tree stand looking around. By about 6.20 p.m., she still hadn't seen any deer and she was starting to get bored, so she decided she would take a selfie. She picked up her Blackberry, she took the selfie, and as soon as she was done, she became aware that the forest had suddenly gone completely quiet. No more squirrels, no more birds, no more crickets, just complete silence. And she knew as a hunter, the only time this happened was when a large predator was in the area and all the other animals went quiet. But Jan would later say there was just something different about this silence. It was so sudden and so complete that it scared her. And she wound up sending another text message to that friend she'd been texting earlier that said the woods just went completely silent very odd. As soon as Jan hit send on that text message and lowered her phone, she immediately became aware of something about 20 feet away in the tree that was right across from her. And she said it was the most unusual and terrifying thing she had ever seen. Moving left to right through the branches was this thing that she described as like a visual distortion. She said it was like looking across pavement on a really hot day and seeing that mirage, except this one looked like it was alive, like it had mass, like it was a a see-through person that had been wrapped in saran wrap. And so Jan thinks it's a floater in her eyes, and so she rubs her eyes, and when she looks up, this thing has now moved down a branch closer to her and has stopped, like it's perched on the branch, staring at her, and Jan's horrified, but she knows she wants to document it, so she grabs her phone and she raises it up and she takes a picture on her Blackberry right as this thing kind of disappears behind the tree and vanishes. Just seconds after this thing disappeared, all the sounds in the forest came back. The birds, the squirrels, the crickets, it was all back to normal, but Jan was really shaken up because she just could not make sense of what she just saw. So she just continued to stare in the general direction of where this thing was for several minutes until finally she felt like it was safe again, at which point she brought her phone up to look at the picture she had taken. When she looked at it, it looked like a blurry mess. And so she thought, oh, I blew it. I put my hand over it or my hair got in the way of it or something. But at the same time, she's thinking to herself, but 
My hair didn't get in the way of it. And I very clearly held it out in front of me and know that I was looking at my phone when I took it and I had a clear shot of this thing. So I don't really understand how this photo got so messed up. But after looking at the picture for a little while, she started to kind of laugh at herself. You know, the idea that she'd just seen a saran wrap person running through the treetops. You know, she just felt like that that didn't happen. It must have been in my head. And as for this picture, I probably just blocked the lens and, and that's it. That night when Jan got back to her house, she did not tell her husband Bruce about what happened to her in the tree stand because again, she's telling herself it was all in her head. They have dinner, they clean up, they sit down in the living room and they're both on their phones and they're just kind of scrolling through the internet and their emails. And at some point, Bruce reacts to something he's reading. He makes a sound and Jan hears him and says, oh, what are you looking at? And he said, you know, I just got a really interesting email from our nephew, you know, the one that goes to school down the road. He said that today they were outside for band practice and at some point all of them turned to look at the forest and there was a bright circular light that was kind of hovering in the forest. And I guess they all stared at it for about five or 10 seconds. And then at some point the light kind of went back into the forest and they didn't know what to make of it. And I guess one of his classmates said that a year before the exact same thing happened and it apparently scared their instructor so badly that they canceled rehearsal and went inside because of it. As Jan is listening to her husband read this email, she's sitting up and her heart is racing. And as soon as he finishes, she says, what time did he say that happened? Bruce picked up how intensely she was asking him. And so he looked at the email, looked back at his wife and was like, it was between 7.50 and eight, why? At this point, Jan revealed everything that had happened to her while she was hunting, you know, seeing that visual distortion in the trees that looked like a figure of some kind. And she would tell him that the forest she was in was the same one their nephew was claiming to have seen this circular light floating inside of. She told him she tried to take a picture of the thing she saw, but the picture didn't come out. But her husband, who is an optical physicist and therefore an expert at analyzing a picture, said, here, let me take a look at it. As soon as he looked at the image, the first thing he asked her was, well, did your hair get in front of the lens? And she said, no, I was holding it about a foot away from my head and my hair was in a ponytail and a ball cap. So that can't be my hair. And so he looked at it again and he asked her, well, did you put your finger over the lens maybe? And she said, yeah, I might have. I don't think I did, but it's certainly possible. And so not really thinking much of this picture, he decides before giving the phone back to just check the resolution of the image because whenever he would examine a picture, that was something he would do and he discovered an anomaly. It turns out Jan's Blackberry was only capable of taking pictures in three distinct resolutions. Basically the size of the image could only come in small, medium or large. And this picture she had taken of this thing she saw in the trees was a resolution size that was not small, medium, or large. It was some random size that the phone was actually not capable of producing. And so he asked his wife, like, did you manipulate your resolution settings? And she said, no, I don't even know how to do that. So Bruce looked at the other couple of pictures she had taken that day, and all of those fell into the small, medium, or large resolution size. It was just this one picture that was a total anomaly. And so Bruce was suddenly really intrigued by this image and by his wife's story. And so he continued to study the image and he kept asking his wife questions about, you know, how she was positioned in the tree stand and where the sun was and how far away this thing was and everything about the whole layout. And eventually Bruce started conducting experiments to see if he could duplicate this image his wife had created. And he got pretty scientific about it and he could not duplicate it. Ultimately, because Bruce trusts his wife did not alter the photo in any way, and he trusts his wife as being truthful about what she experienced in the tree stand, you know, what she saw, and based on his years of being an optical physicist, Bruce believes whatever was in the trees distorted this image. That even if she had put her finger over the lens, which he doesn't think she did, and she doesn't think she did, the picture resolution was altered in such a way that something had to have an effect on it. There was a third party effect on this picture. If you're interested in reading all of Bruce's scientific findings about this picture, I have included his write-up that he posted online in the sources below. So that's gonna do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please offer to make the like button a hot pocket, but instead of letting it stand in the microwave for two minutes, serve it immediately so when they bite down, they're met with the tongue scalding cheese lava flow within. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. 
Insights. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.